Multigreen, building attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily real estate through impact investing. Welcome to the Multigreen Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Norton, and today we'll be speaking with the legend, Ron Terwilliger. He is the former CEO of Trammell Crow Residential. He is Chairman Emeritus of Habitat for Humanity, and he is currently Chairman of the Executive Committee at the J. Ronald Terwilliger Foundation for Housing America's Families. In this episode, you'll discover who was the recipient of a historic $100 million pledge and learn why attainability matters. Enjoy our conversation. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. You're welcome. I am so grateful to know you as well as Fred Tuomi, who made this introduction. And I know that you have one of the most prolific backgrounds in um, residential housing. Can you just give us a quick background on how you entered the industry and where you are today with Habitat Humanity? Yeah, um, thanks. I When I got out of business school, I had decided I wanted to be in real estate. And the first job I had was at Hilton Head Island, South Carolina at the Sea Pines Company. And this is back in the early 70s. And uh, we were building resort communities in Puerto Rico, Amelia Island, Florida, and on Hilton Head Island. But unfortunately, we financed them with 100% debt. So when the recession of 74, 75 came, everybody was bankrupt. And I left and I spent three years as a chief financial officer of a general contractor in Dallas, Texas, at which point Trammell Crow, who lived in Dallas, was domiciled there. And a former Harvard Business School classmate of mine who was running his residential companies offered me a partnership. And I moved to Atlanta and I started Crow to Wilger Company in residential. We were doing condos. We were doing... uh, whatever made sense, condo conversions. And uh, then I discovered rental apartments. And a couple of years later, I was asked to run the national company, which I did for the next 25 years. We were the largest apartment developers in the U.S. And along that journey, I began to accumulate meaningful wealth. And kind of probably in my mid-50s, I decided to both start giving away my money and giving away my time I had a lot of credibility in the industry as running the largest multifamily developer. I joined Habitat's board 21 years ago. I currently chair Enterprise Community Partners Board for the last 11 years. That's another housing-focused nonprofit. At the Urban Land Institute, where I served as chairman, I started the Twilger Center for Workforce Housing probably 11 years ago. So much of my life the last 20, 25 years has combined for-profit businesses with not-for-profit. And I spend the majority of my time in the not-for-profit community, both giving away my wealth and sharing boards and sitting on boards. I don't know of anyone with a more comprehensive background, anyone that could understand this residential uh, marketplace more than you and how complicated it can be. But I also know that you've been able to enlist some presidential help Uh, even Jimmy Carter, I believe, uh, is heavily involved at Habitat for Humanity. Is that right? Well, I wouldn't take credit for that, but what happened is Habitat was started by Millard Fuller, who lived in America's Georgia. President Carter is from Plains, Georgia, and they went to the same church. And so after Millard got launched and after President Carter, good old Naval Academy grad like myself, Um, stepped down as president, he went on the board of Habitat, which was pretty amazing. And uh, Millard would tell me that President Carter would attend all the board meetings. He'd stay the entire time. He'd take notes, ask good questions. He's he's really a remarkable man, no matter what you thought of his presidency. And now at 96, he still has Carter bills. So he still is, to many people, the face of Habitat, Um, even though we've had a great CEO who I helped recruit 16 years ago, Jonathan Reckford, President Carter really put Habitat on the map in the United States and and also somewhat around the world. That's great insight. I had no idea. 
So you've been in the private sector, uh, the public sector, for-profit, non-profit. Can you help me define this word called attainable housing? Well, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to describe the challenge, not only Americans, but people worldwide. I work worldwide for Habitat in fundraising, and I was Habitat's international board chair, so I saw poverty housing around the world. Uh, a lot of times people use the term affordable housing. Um, to some, that has a pejorative connotation as these people are not really worthy. Um, I currently co-chair Habitat's U.S. advocacy campaign. We call the issue housing affordability. Um, so attainable housing to me means housing, whether it be home ownership or rental, that is affordable to families and not a cost burden to them. Um, it is a problem in the US. I, I spent three years walking the halls of the federal government talking to senators and congressmen about the housing crisis in this country. And to my surprise, with very few exceptions, they didn't really seem to realize we had a housing crisis. It is one of the challenges we have is that people who can do something about it generally are well housed and don't have an issue and don't seem to think about, you know, the struggles that so many of our service people are enduring trying to afford a decent place to live. And one point, point I would say exacerbated by the pandemic where you're supposed to, you know, quarantine in place. Well, for homeless people uh, and for people crowded into um, small units, that's really hard to do, which is one of the reasons I think the minorities have such a high rate of infection is because they're clustered together in, in inadequate housing if they have a roof over their house. And just this morning, um, the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies released the article of housing perspectives and how the affordability challenges for low-income home homeowners have intensified even during the pandemic. You know, during a good economy, bad economy, or a pandemic, we just can't seem to win. No, I mean, you take the pandemic and it just exacerbated an existing challenge. Um, one of the interesting things I'm doing now is I gave Habitat for Humanity a $100 million legacy gift when I stepped down as chairman. And I'm trying to fund it during my lifetime or some of it. And uh, so about... Oh, five years ago, I made a $15 million pledge, $3 million a year, and we created the Twilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter, which is working overseas on market-based solutions. You might find it interesting. This is not a domestic issue, which is probably your concern, but you know, in the world, about 70% of the houses are built by the homeowners, and, and they have you know, save and build, or they build sequentially. Um, so we're really working hard to try to help them with better solutions. And, and part of the Twilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter is a micro-build fund. We had a $100 million fund to make small loan to homeowners for improvements in their properties, some of which uh, were properties where they run their businesses out of. So they say 1.6 billion people in the world live in poverty housing. I think it's probably double that. Hard for people to measure it. But it's getting worse all the time. And part of the reason is that people's incomes just have not been able to keep up. Well, that is great insight. So why does all of this matter? Specifically, why does attainable housing matter? Yeah, you know, you go back to basic human needs, food, clothing, and shelter. We're talking about shelter here. Now, you know, as... as much work as I've done in the nonprofit community and particularly at Enterprise Community Partners, which was founded by Jim Rouse many years ago, we, we talk about the opportunity agenda for families. And what we aspire to is having families have an opportunity to move up and out of poverty. We think at the foundation is housing. It's hard to understand how people in the family could get a good education if they don't have a safe house to retreat to. Of course, in our country, because of the segregation uh, perpetuated by the federal government for decades, um, there's a great book called The Rule of Law that, that really 
shows you, I think it's Richard Rothstein who wrote it. He's, he's actually on our advisory board at Habitat now. Uh, tells about the segregation policies of the federal government. The blacks were clustered in, into really poor areas with terrible schools. Uh, they didn't have very decent schools. So the, the opportunity agenda suggests that housing is foundational, but also families need a good education for their kids so that they can get a job and become independent. They need health care. They need healthy food. They need access to transportation. And part of the struggle in our country, and I suspect it's the same around the world, particularly since zoning laws are local and the phenomena of not in my backyard or NIMBY is rampant, we're all, we're all somewhat selfish, I fear. Um, the low-income people have, low-income families have a hard time getting a home that's affordable in a decent neighborhood with good schools. And that's, that's really a challenge society is facing today. Uh, I think the Black Lives Matter, the, the racial equity, you know, a lot of things that have come out of George Floyd's unbelievable death are, are elevating, maybe for the first time in my life, this issue, which I hope will stay on the forefront of people's lives because all of us now are dealing with diversity, equity, inclusion, and we need to give our minority population, black and brown, more opportunity than they've had. And I think it starts with housing. I totally agree. That's a very good definition. And you mentioned this is not just a California issue or just a North American issue. This is a global crisis and you are on the forefront of this. So I, I don't know how to explain this um, any other way, but we've been trying to research this and understand it both academically and professionally. I can't figure this out. What are the key structural problems that are still needing to be solved uh, in order for the residential housing industry to improve? Well, you know, whether it's rental housing or home ownership, um, the family needs to be able to afford the rent or the mortgage payment. Unfortunately, in our country, with a lot of, of minority families, but not limited to minority families, a lot of families working at uh, jobs that don't pay enough, even if two people in the family are working, they can't afford the rent. You know, there's always the, the notion that a person working minimum wage can't afford a two bedroom apartment in any city in this country. So we, we, we struggle to be able to build new housing at a price point where people can afford it, either to rent it or own it. Part of it is construction cost. I'm in the business now. Uh, I retired from Trammell Crow in 2008, and then about four years later, I started a new business in the Southeast, and now I'm in three development businesses building rental apartments, but, but we principally build market rate apartments. Um, and I just know that it cost us in the Southeast about $170,000 per unit for a 900 square foot apartment. It's the cheapest apartment that we can build. And half the country cannot afford the rent we have to charge in that apartment. So then you're left with, is anybody going to subsidize these families that cannot afford market rate? Well, in this country, we subsidize in two ways. We subsidize new production, but the only meaningful tool of scale is the low-income housing tax credit. That came out of the 1986 Tax Act. It does a great job but only for about 50,000 new starts a year. And then it provides enough capital to maybe repair and maintain another 50,000. Sounds like a lot, but National Multi-Housing Council tells us we lose 125,000 units a year. So we're building 50 and losing 125. That's not a good progress. And that's on the supply side. So in order to offset the cost of land in construction, there has to be a subsidy um, or jurisdictions have to mandate affordable housing. Now, some jurisdictions like here in Long Island, where my wife and I have a little company, uh, they require 10% of the units to be set aside for people making 80% or less area median income, and they subsidize it through a tax abatement. So that's one tool is a tax abatement. But if the local jurisdictions and or the state and federal government don't subsidize, it's really hard for people to be able to afford it without using a way disproportionate amount of their income. 
On the demand side, we have vouchers, Section 8 vouchers, but unfortunately, they're a part of an annual appropriation. They don't work through the tax code. And, you know, as tough as we are today with trying to, you know, of course, come out of the pandemic, um, there's not enough voucher money. Only one in five families who qualify for vouchers get it. It's like winning the lottery. Just to, you know, kind of belabor it a point. And then one of the problems, of course, is if you have a voucher and you want to move into a middle income neighborhood with good schools, a lot of times the landlord, landlord won't take your voucher, which I think should be illegal, but apparently it's not. There's some people in Congress trying to address that. So on the supply side, there's not nearly enough new affordable housing built. And on the demand side, there's not nearly enough money allocated to help the families. So you end up with half your renters being cost burdened in this country and 25% spending more than 50% of their income on housing. Those are amazing statistics. I uh, continue to read about these headlines every single day and Multigreen was created to try and to be a solution in this marketplace. You know, we got a long way to go, but if you could have a wand and solve all of these problems, where would you even start? Well, there's a couple of answers. Number one, um, the federal government, and this is the point I made walking the halls of Congress for three years, the federal government was spending enough money, but the majority of it was going for mortgage interest deduction, which to me is absurd. Uh, the only people who get the benefit of the mortgage interest deduction are people who itemize, and those are generally wealthy people. So if they'd taken all the subsidy in the tax code from mortgage interest deduction and put it in vouchers or for expanding low-income housing tax credits, that would have gone a long way towards solving the problem. So that's at the federal level. We should um, reform and re-engineer how we subsidize the lower income families in our country to have an acceptable place to live. And incidentally, I think having a place to live is a basic human right. And I wish our government would take it up that way. Um, so the other way is to do some reforming at the local level. In the United States, we delegate zoning decisions to local jurisdictions. And there's a disproportionate amount of pressure put on local officials by their neighbors and their voters to keep the lower income people out of the better neighborhoods. And as long as that exists, NIMBY is a part of the description for it, it's gonna be hard to enjoy the opportunity agenda for these families because, and I even saw it at Habitat, I, I reminded from time to time Habitat that in, in the numbers game of each affiliate trying to build as many houses, sometimes they didn't pay enough attention to where they were building the houses and build some Habitat slums, which um, I think Habitat's much more aware of now and, and uh, focusing hard on getting into better neighborhoods, opportunity neighborhoods. So, you know, you've got, you've got the jurisdictions at the local level where the zoning rules are made and exclusionary zoning takes place. And then you got a lack of adequate subsidy at any level. And subsidy can come from uh, tax abatement. It can come conceivably at the state level with financing or, or, or uh, tax rates. And, it, and, and the reason I spent three years talking to senators and congressmen is because like the old Jesse James Wiley, Rob Banks, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> there, there was enough money being spent at the federal level. It was just not being spent in the right way. That's great insight. Do you foresee this nimbyism changing to yimbyism? Yes, in my backyard. Well, I, I like that clever slogan, but I don't think so. I think it's human nature. You know, your house is your biggest investment. So you finally get to a point where you can buy a house in the suburbs. And let's say it's a $500,000 house in the Southeast or Southwest. That's a big deal. You know, it's a 4,000 square foot house. And then somebody wants to plop down an apartment project down the block. And you think, oh my God, who are these people? They're probably gonna depreciate my property value. They're not gonna be like me. They may not even look like me. Um, I'm not gonna support that. And I think that just goes on over and over and over. And it's understandable to some degree, um, 
as I said, we're all inherently selfish. And if you take the investment people have in their homes, their biggest investment, they're probably hypersensitive about it. I, I think there's a lot of misinformation about apartments. I've been an apartment developer for 40 years. I've built, I think, more apartments than anyone else in this country, probably 300,000 all over the United States. I've built affordable housing as well. Um, and I have not seen a circumstance, particularly with market rate apartments or mixed income. Incidentally, I think the ideal way is to have mixed income where you have 10, 15, 20, 30% of the apartment's income restricted and the rest the market. I've not seen anywhere that that really caused home values to go down. Somebody's probably going to tell me I'm wrong because I don't study it, but I've read a lot of studies and I've been involved in this business for a long time in a lot of jurisdictions. And I've never seen quality rental apartment project, whether it was market rate or mixed income that caused a diminution in values in the homes in the area. But that's what homeowners are afraid of. That's great insight. Thanks for sharing that today. Well, as you know, uh, Fred Tuomi referred us to you, and Fred Tuomi uh, recently joined our board. Um, and in the spirit of multi-green, I want to ask all of our interviewees how they think about green. So, you know, it's basically a word association game here. Yeah. When you think of multi-green or, you know, in the spirit of multi-green, what are a few of your favorite green things? Well, you know, when I was thinking of it in the context of real estate, I think of green building. You know, I think of people who are sensitive to energy efficiency and sustainability in building. You get outside the context of uh, real estate. I think of golf courses and nature. But in the, uh, in the industry that I've been a part of, been blessed to be a part of for the last 50 years, um, I think of green building and people being more aware of the implications of the materials they use, the finishes they use in energy efficiency. We're, we're rewarded, in, interestingly, somewhat from doing that, but in order to get financing, uh, you know, you just have to do a modicum of green building, but that's, that's what I would think of. That's, that's a great response. So this is my last question for you today, Ron. It is now 2020. Multi-green is at the end of its very first year of operations. You may have known, uh, you may not know, but we publicly launched from Davos, Switzerland earlier this year at the 50th annual World Economic Forum. And we announced that multi-green would improve the state of the world by constructing 40,000 attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily homes. So if you had one wish for us at Multigreen, what would it be? Well, it would be that you were funded to do what you proposed to do. Um, and I guess that it got enough press that you got enough you know, coverage that people would pay attention. I asked Mike Huckabee, my friend whose wife served on the Habitat board with me, why politicians didn't talk about housing. And he said to me, Ron, you know, it's because our constituents don't ask about it. And I kind of thought, Mike, what constituents are you talking about? The guys who give you money, the people who have access to you, you know, the people who need help with housing, I guess they don't have access to you because there's enormous need that I learned walking the halls of Congress that congressmen, senators, representatives don't realize we have a housing crisis. And therefore, when they think about where their priorities are, they don't think about housing. Well, let's do whatever we can to get this uh, story out. I love your story, Ron. Uh, thank you so much for sharing it with us today. And I hope that we can check in periodically and report back to you on how our production and, and um, what our track record becomes. But, you know, having professionals like yourself around us and just pointing us in the right direction is, uh, is fantastic. Thank you so much again for joining us from New York City. And thanks again, Ron. Good luck to you. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you for listening. Join us as we build 40,000 attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily homes by 2030. And if you like the content you're hearing, hit the subscribe button. Follow us at Think Multigreen and sign up to learn more at www.multi.green.